and we are on chapter two of sketches. Brent opened the motel room door with a flourish. He stepped inside and flicked on an overhead light. The room was tiny, and even with the light from the single bulb, it looked dingy and dark. We followed him in. It smells, Ashley said. It did have a strange odor, sort of like a musty, damp mothballs. I'll open a window. I threw back the curtains to reveal a dumpster sitting in the parking lot directly across from us. Nice view. And it turned out the windows were nailed shut. Then again, what was I expecting for 25 bucks? Besides, it was better than the place where we stayed the night before, an abandoned house with boarded up windows. We climbed in through a hole where a panel busted out the back door. Actually, come to think of it, the two places smelled about the same. I looked around the room. There was a dresser, a TV, and two twin-sized beds separated by a little nightstand. There was paint peeling from the walls, a big yellow water stain on the ceiling, and the furniture looked shabby, like stuff the Salvation Army might have thrown out. A few weeks before, I wouldn't have even dreamed of ever setting foot in a place like this. Now, I couldn't wait to put my head down on that stained bed cover. Brent walked around the beds and opened another door. He hit the lights to reveal a bathroom. So what do you think? He said, gesturing grandly around him. It's a lot better than sleeping under a bridge or in some squat, Ashley commented. Dana? It doesn't look that bad, I said, trying to convince myself that Ashley and spare Brett's feelings at the same time. How come we could get this place for 25 bucks when the sign out says this 39.99? Ashley asked. That's the price for regular people, you know, like tourists. Tourists? I laughed. Do you really think tourists would stay in a place like this? Maybe really poor tourists, Brent joked. Either way, I know the guy at the desk, and if his boss isn't around and there are empty rooms, he lets people like us stay here. And if his boss is around, I asked. No point in even showing up. He'll just call the cops. He thinks he's running a class place. Ashley laughed. If he thinks this is class, then he either has to take more medication or stop the medication he's on, because that's just delusional thinking. Delusional or not, his boss will be working here tomorrow morning, and he won't want to see us, so we'll have to get out of here early. How early is early? Ashley asked. Like around seven? Great, she said, shaking her head. This will be the first real bed I've slept in for weeks, and I don't get to sleep in. Does your friend tell his boss that he's rented out these rooms? I asked. Now you're catching on, he said and smiled. I think the money stays in his pocket. But what do I care? He's doing us a favor. If he was really doing us a favor, he wouldn't charge us at all. Ashley pointed out. Yeah, like that's going to happen. Somebody giving somebody something for nothing. Everything and everybody has a price, Brent said. A month ago, I think I might have disagreed with him. Now I wasn't so sure. Speaking of price, just how much money do we have left? Brent asked. Let's put all our money together and count it, Ashley suggested. Everybody emptied out their pockets, digging out the coins and bills buried in there. I've got $17.28, Brent said, smoothing out the bills on top of the bed and heaping the coins up with it. Of course, his total included the change from the 40 bucks after he'd paid for the room. Here's mine, Ashley added. I've got six dollars and twenty-five, fifty, seventy-eight cents. She dropped it onto the bed on top of Brent's money. How about you, Dana? I've got around nine dollars and one subway ticket, I said as I deposited my money onto the bed as well. A subway ticket? Ashley asked. Were you really planning on actually going home? Somebody gave it to me. What was I supposed to say? Sorry, I'm really begging for money, and I don't want to take the subway. We must have enough money for supper. And cigarettes, Ashley added. I shook my head. We'd do a lot better if we didn't waste so much money on cigarettes. Buying cigarettes isn't a waste, Brent said. It's worse than a waste. Smoking can kill you. Ashley laughed. I'm still alive, and I've been smoking since I was 11. 11? You're joking, right? She shook her head. I can't get over the fact that you don't smoke. Brent was sorting the money into bills and coins. We have a grand total of $32.85. Takes him out for burgers and fries at Mickey D's. 
Oh, hey, maybe we should get the Happy Meal, kids, so we can get the toy. And we'll still have enough left over to get us all a coffee to start tomorrow off and pick up some cigarettes. If we didn't buy cigarettes, then we'd have enough for breakfast tomorrow, too, I said. You've got a point there, Brent agreed. Let's put it to a vote. All those in favor of buying cigarettes, raise your hand. Both Brent's and Ashley's hands shot up into the air. This was one vote I knew I could never win. Fine, I said. You two can have your cigarettes, but it only seems fair that I should get something as well. What did you have in mind? Brent asked. I get the shower first. You got no arguments for me, Brent said. Me neither, Ashley agreed. Would m'lady care for me to run a bath for her? Brent asked, trying his best to sound like an English butler. I don't want a bath. I want a shower, a long, hot shower. I get the shower next, Ashley said. In that case, maybe I should take the money and go get our food and bring it back here, Brent suggested as he reached down to scoop up the money. And you are going to get food, right? Ashley asked. I turned to face her. What did she mean by that? Of course, Brent said. He looked sheepish. I wanted to ask, but I didn't. All I wanted was a shower. How about you get me a Big Mac meal? Ashley said. Same for me, but hold the pickles, I said. We'll make it three, he said as he stuffed the money into his pocket. I'll be back soon, so don't take too long in the shower. Brent started for the door. Brent? Ashley called, and he stopped and turned around. Don't worry, he said. He opened the door and left. What was all that about? I asked. Nothing, Ashley said. Well, nothing much. I gave her a questioning look. A couple of times, Brent took our money and went to get food, but he didn't get food. What'd he get? He got stoned, she explained. Brent did that? That doesn't sound like him. It was a long time ago, she said, like over a month. Besides, he doesn't do drugs now. What do you mean? I've seen him smoke dope before. Oh, that was just marijuana. He doesn't do any real drugs, she paused. I also told him if he ever did that to me again, I'd make him pay. I told him his life was worth more than 20 bucks. Ashley had such a hard look on her face, I knew she wasn't just joking around. Ashley was pretty tough, and I knew I never wanted to get on her bad side. A few weeks ago, I would have crossed the street to walk on the other side if I'd seen her coming. Can I ask you something? I began. Sure. That cop, he said, he said he might do something worse than just arrest me if he saw me again. What did he mean? He meant that he might smack you around. He'd do that? She laughed. You sound surprised. But police can't just hit people. They're cops. They can do anything they want. But it's illegal to just hit somebody. It's against the law. I protested. She laughed louder. You really are from the suburbs. What's that supposed to mean? It means that the only contact you probably had with cops is when they gave your parents a speeding ticket. It's different down here. Cops do some things that aren't exactly by the book. You're telling me that all the cops downtown smack people around? I asked. Not all cops, she said. Most of them are okay, but not all of them. And you've seen this? I've seen lots of things. Some guy doesn't do what the cop says or maybe resist them. Then one thing leads to another. Have you ever been hit? I've been pushed around before, but never hit. Like I said, just don't resist. If they say to move along, just move along. Don't argue. Don't give them any lip or attitude and you'll be okay. I decided right then that no one was going to have to tell me twice. I wasn't going to give anybody any attitude. If any cop ever told me to leave, I'd just leave. There was still one thing that nagged at me. The cop said that every kid on the street hooks. Everyone. Not everyone, Ashley said. That's what I thought. I'd never do that, I protested. Ashley didn't answer right away. You should never say never. I know I'll never hook. Ashley gave me a look, a look of despair and anger and upset and disbelief and so many other things that I couldn't understand. There was a time when I thought the same thing. Have, ha have you? I asked, the words jumping out before I realized what I was saying. She didn't answer. I'm, 
I'm sorry, I stammered. I, I shouldn't have asked. It it's none of my business. That's okay, she said. She sat there in silence, staring at the wall. Sometimes, she said, her voice barely a whisper, you do what you have to do. The hot water streamed down my face and body. I'd almost used up the little bar of soap scrubbing my body, trying to remove the dirt and sweat and smells that had accumulated since I'd last showered. Hard to believe that was over three weeks ago. I would have felt bad about using up so much soap, but there was a second bar sitting on the sink that Ashley and Brent could use. I unscrewed the top of the little container of shampoo and conditioner and smelled it. It was some sort of peachy fragrance. Not my favorite, but beggars can't be choosers. And I guess I was a real beggar now, after all. It wasn't like at home where there was a dozen different types of shampoo for different types of hair, as well as conditioners and special shower gels. Sometimes I thought my friends and I spent more what time about wearing what was on our heads than what was in our heads. I wondered what Sarah and Samantha were doing right now. Probably watching TV or talking on the phone to each other or on MSN, the original chat. Or what was the point in thinking about any of that? I wondered if they thought about me the way that I still thought about them. Would they have any idea at all of what was happening to me now? I tipped the shampoo into my hand, careful to use only one third of the bottle. I put it down and then, with both hands, worked up a lather of suds in my hair. The smell got stronger as the suds built up. I ducked my head under the stream of water and started to rinse out the soapy lather. I worked it around and around. The water pulsated through my hair against my scalp. It felt so good. The hot water massaging my head, the feel of my hair, squeaky and clean. The steam rising up, the sweet peachy smell. I could have stayed in the shower for hours. That's what my mother used to say I did. She'd yell up the stairs for me to hurry or I'd be late for school. She'd even send my little sister up to pound on the door. Boy, it used to irritate me when she did that. All I wanted was to be left alone in the shower, behind the locked door. The noise of the shower blocking out all the other sounds, blocking out everything. That was all I wanted to do now, but I couldn't. Ashley needed to take her shower, and Brent might already be back with the food. I wondered how long it would be before I got a chance to have another shower. Just then, I wouldn't have been minded my sister pounding on the door. I missed her a lot. I knew she would be confused by what I'd done, worried, upset. I wish I could have explained things to her about why I had to leave, but I didn't, and I couldn't. I couldn't tell her. I couldn't tell anybody. The suds cascaded down my neck and back and front along my arms. I watched as the water and suds forms ripples as they passed over the little scars that covered my arms. I touched them with my fingers, tracing the lines. They were fading, but they were still visible. Some of the marks, the deeper ones, would never fade away. Tears came. The warm tears flooded down my cheeks and got lost in the water flowing out of the shower head. I started to sob. My whole body got shaky and my legs felt all rubbery and weak. I slumped down on the tiled floor of the shower. I thought about my sister and my mother and my friends and my school and my room and about how I missed every one of them how I missed them all so much. And then I thought about my stepfather, and the sobbing subsided, and the sadness was replaced, replaced by anger, and the searing heat of that anger dried up the tears.